profession and business. Hi, Dr. Uh, Walter Milton, how are you? I'm well. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. So we were hoping that you might uh, give us a little bit of in, insight in what it is you do in your business. Okay, okay great. Well, I am a uh, CEO of BH365 uh, slash uh, FCH, or From the Heart International Educational Services. What we do is develop textbooks. Um, we do research. And we also present in school systems across the country. Our products currently, uh, we're in well over 220 school systems across the nation. I have a staff of 70 people. And many of us were former school superintendents, principals, uh, researchers, and college professors. Oh, wow. That's quite a bit. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's quite a bit of business. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, well, welcome to our show, and uh, we are, uh, you know, would like to hear a lot about what it is you're doing, and uh, you can just break it down for us if you like, a little bit okay. more. Okay, absolutely. So we create uh, kinder garden um, materials all the way up through the college level. We um, are. In, like I said, 200 plus school systems, and our goal is to hit at least four or five thousand school systems across the country. We uh, provide uh, educational services from consulting, uh, we train teachers, we train school leaders, we train students, uh, parents, school boards, and also superintendents on our on our curriculum. Um, our curriculum is entitled Black History 365, an inclusive account of American history. We are currently developing another series of textbooks um, for Latino and Caribbean um, history as well. Oh, wow, that's so amazing. So we're really excited uh, to, em to embark upon uh, that journey. And I have some very talented people that are with me, and I have to give them a lot of the, a lot of the glory and a lot of the credit. Oh, wow. Well, that's amazing. Thank you. So the Black History 365 comes at a time when there is uh, the Black History Month. I mean, there's quite a bit going on there, and I guess it's quite educational for a lot of people. And uh, being open for Latino and the other Caribbeans that you mentioned, wow, that's quite a, quite a, a feat on your 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 uh, what it is you're doing it in, inside your company. Absolutely, and we wanted to make sure that not only were we um, you know, aiming for Black History Month, but by the title of our series of uh, books, uh, Black History 365, what we're saying is that it's an inclusive account of American history. That's the subtitle. Okay. And as we know, American history is every day. Um, so it's 365, and we just really talk about, you know, the contributions, the amazing um, accomplishments that uh, black people have made to the development of the United States of America. We start in ancient Africa and we come all the way past George Floyd. Um, we have QR codes uh, that go with the book. We have music uh, that was developed for us by Jay-Z's uh, Drake T.I. Snoop Dogg's producer, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Kevin K. O. Tate. So we knew that uh, we had to have a strong integration of technology into the textbook. So not only do we have e-books, but we have a plethora of QR codes that can take the reader on an amazing journey. So we are, we are super, super excited 
about about our work and the impact that we're making across the United States uh, as we speak. Well, uh, technology does play a major part, and that's like one of the first steps in something becoming major, you know, and that's uh, quite amazing what it is you guys are doing through uh, technology being uh, one of the bases for what it is you're getting at doing inside your company. So, wow, that's great. Absolutely. We live in a, we live in a uh, technological changing world i mean technology. yes emerging technology is something that is uh quite <laughs> quite something that people really need to be able to keep up with and you know it's just it changes what every two years or so absolutely absolutely and one of the things that we admire about uh this form of technology is that uh, that the students could hold the life of our work right in the palm of their hand. They yeah. can even download it on their on their cell phones. Right. What can you do and without so, your phone nowadays, too? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. We we have a lot of interactive information that you know that the students could visit with, and they can interact with, and they can learn a lot, a, la- a great deal of information. And one of the things that was critically important to us is that we wanted to take an amazing opportunity to. Um, to do away with the many stereotypes and misconceptions that have wreaked havoc over our great nation for so many years and bring about a strong sense of clarity to say that, hey, you know, let's talk about America. Let's talk about the contributions of America in in a good light. And hopefully people can see our work as our love letter to the world, that we can bring about healing and cohesiveness, which we so dearly need in this nation. Absolutely. I agree with that. Hi, Dr. Milton. It's Derek Walker. Hey, Mr. Walker. How are you doing today? I am doing good. Just got here. A lovely rainy day in Southern California. Traffic piled up. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I can definitely agree with you in terms of traffic because the traffic in the DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth, is I mean, it's it's probably going to die down later on tonight, and I'm in the midst of it right now. Right. And I do want to say that um, what, what's what's interesting is that it's rather cold here. We have a cold front. Um, earlier this week, it was in the 80s, and today, you know, woke up and outside, and it was freezing. So it's about 48 degrees as we speak. Wow. Yeah. Well, we got some of that too. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. How did the genesis of this come about for you? I heard some of your interviews on in other places, and you talked about how you were superintendent at some of the school systems. How, how did the genesis of this project come about for you? That's a really, really good question, and hopefully you can indulge me for a few moments in the sure. audience. Oh, Absolutely. Well to just really talk about this. And, and I, I do want to say that I believe that I'm a vessel um, to, to lead this work. I, I, I'd like to give credit away opposed to taking credit. But I had a very traumatic experience um, in the younger years of my life. I was a fourth grade student, and I just really admired and loved my teacher, Miss Laudisi. I mean, she was a great lady, and, and she tried really hard to make sure that we were getting a a globalized education, an education that was going to prepare us for the world. And she told us that she was going to teach black history the following day. And I got really excited. I'm like, man, I went home and I told my mom and dad that, 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 you know, my teacher's going to teach us black history. And I, and I want to thank my parents for teaching me a lot of black history because they would remind me that, I'm a descendant of a king and a queen, and I have to act that way. I have to make sure that um, I took my education seriously and that I did my best because I come from greatness. And so I really um, inculcated that um, in in, in my academic DNA. And so I told my mother, I said, hey, I want to wear my favorite suit. And actually it was the only suit that I owned at that time in my young life. And it was uh, getting a little too small for me. And she said, you sure you want to wear it? I said, yes, Mom, I want to wear it. (laughs) Put on my snap-on tie. And and I I went to school, and I just made sure that I sat in the front row that that, that day. And I was, uh, you know, anticipating raising my hand. 
But Miss Laudisi said, we're going to start with a film strip. And she, she showed this film, and, and I was just enraged. I, it ushered so much shame and humiliation because the first thing that I saw was an outraged so-called slave master beating an enslaved person profusely. And like I said, it just evoked so much anger in me. And I couldn't wait to get home and, and just really challenge my mother and father because I said, you know, you didn't, you didn't tell me this part that we were slaves and, and we, you know, were, were, we had to work in the field and, 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 and whites were over us and all of this, 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 this information with tears in my eyes. And I was at the bottom of eight. So I had a little wiggle room in my behavior because I think my parents were a little tired when I came about. And my mother grabbed me and she just had put her hands or her arms around me. She said, you know, one day you are going to be able to tell this story. And so didn't think about it. Um, let me fast forward ahead. So I was one of those guys that talked to my mom just about every day and my, and my father. And so one day my mother and I had a really in-depth conversation and she said, you know, God is calling you to do something greater than what you're doing. And I said, oh, mom, please, not today. And, <laughs> and the reason I said that, because my mother had like a thousand percent batting average in terms of her predictions. Um, whenever she predicted something, it definitely came to fruition. Oh, that's great. So I said, you know, mom, I love being a superintendent. You know, I'm doing really well, making a lot of money, building new schools. I said, I think I'm pretty happy. I don't, I don't want to. To, to leave this, she said, well, you're being called for something greater. You're going to be the best candidate for bigger jobs, but you're not going to get the job because you, your, your time is up. You know, and I had been a superintendent almost about 14 years at that time. And so um, my mom said that I may be dead and gone, but you're going to listen to me. And unfortunately, later on that week, my mother died unexpectedly. Uh. And it just it just evoked so much in my spirit. So I went to my school board. I talked to my family, talked to my wife, my siblings, and I said, I think I'm going to resign. And I resigned uh, from um, my leadership in Springfield, Illinois. I was there for eight years. And I started um, a company. The company um, is from the heart, International Educational Services, and we're still operative today. Okay. to this day rather, and doing really well with the company. You know, we were we were making major progress, doing work all over the country, just some amazing work, but, it, but there was still a void. And I remember just waking up in the middle of the night one night, and I just started writing, and I couldn't stop writing. You know, I'm a history fanatic, and I just started writing, and I couldn't stop, and I just kept writing more and more and more. And then I thought about it. You know, I said, man, this is really cathartic. I'm going, to, I'm going to do the same tomorrow. And so I just kept doing this every night. And then it hit me. The light bulb went off. And I remember that conversation that I had with my, with my, with my mom. And I thought about what I felt like, you know, with my younger self. And I said, okay, I get it now. And I began to write more. And I started to pull away from the day-to-day -day operational functions of From the Heart International Educational Services, and I just kept writing. And I contacted a, a buddy of mine. Um, I just moved to Dallas at that time, but I had my home in Nashville, Tennessee, and I said, hey, could you meet me in Nashville? I'll fly up. I need to show something to you, and I want to talk to you about what I'm doing. And this gentleman is a curator of many images, images that people have never seen before. And he's a collector of African-American images. And this oldest image went back to 1563. And I said, hey, I want you to be on my team, and I want you to join me in putting something out that has never been completed in, 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 the, in the history of this, this country. He said, I'm with you. Dr. Joel Freeman and I went to work. We wrote for anywhere between 12, 14, 16-hour days every day for almost three years. And as a result of it, we came up with Black History 365, an inclusive account of American history.
we narrowed the book down to 1,248 pages. We had well over uh, 3,000 page because pages rather because there was just so much information. And it and, is a very big book. Thank you. I got you, mine yesterday. You. It is what 10 pounds, 20 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> It feels that way. It's about 6.3 pounds. Okay. And, and that's still a heavy book, yeah, no matter right. how you try to slice and dice it. Um, and then we, uh, you know, just begin to accumulate a lot of people until we had our team in a full force of 70 people. And we've gone on to do early childhood uh, information. We've written um, pre-K books as well as kindergarten books all the way through uh, third grade through eighth grade, eighth grade through uh, ninth through twelfth grade, and also uh, we have the college versions uh, as well. And so we are really, really excited. We are on an, an amazing journey that we're making um, an indelible impact across this great country that we live in. Sure, that is so great. And you mentioned the other day that there's 800 public schools that the book is in now? Wow. Well, if we look at schools, we are probably well into the thousands of schools, but we are in 200 school systems. Many of those systems, like New York City, they have thousands of schools. Right. And so we are in a number of schools in New York City. Uh, we are in Denver, Colorado. We're in Oregon. Um, we're in Detroit, Michigan. I mean, I can go on and on to talk about, you know, how many how many schools that, that, that we're in. But we are in many parts uh, of the of the nation. So and I'm really honored uh, to lead the charge as we continue to grow and grow every day. That is very good. Very good. So for someone, you know, who wants to be an entrepreneur, who wants to get something started, like this or maybe not exactly the same thing is basically our audience people that want to to start a business that want to get a business going it just starts with an idea absolutely absolutely it, it really does it starts with an idea it starts with a vision and i think one of the things you have to do is put fear aside and you have to really look at and I hate to say this because I don't mean to offend anyone, but when I was looking at this, and I was doing really well as a superintendent, but the acronym just over broke, or you can change the B to anything you want to, um, <clears throat> it really resonated with me because I always talked about generational wealth and making sure that my children's children, children, children never had to work for anyone. You know, all of those those things just stayed with me. Certainly. And... I just felt like I was um, on a mission ever since my childhood to be an entrepreneur. And so I just said, well, I can't get hijacked. And that's what my mom was saying. And she said, you were destined to do your own thing. And not only did I have the vision, I began to think about actualizing the vision by putting the necessary work into the vision. And as a result of it, you know, here I am today. Right. Well, this is really a great project, and you're based in uh, Dallas, Texas right now? Yes, our headquarters are in Dallas. We started in Nashville, Tennessee, and we moved the entire operation um, here in Dallas. We're in Arlington, Texas. That's where our offices are, and we do have a small office still in Nashville, but Dallas is, is mainly our headquarters. Okay. Now, you mentioned to me a while back that you had a – separate project basically that was a type of school or academy that you're looking into as well absolutely absolutely we purchased 40 uh, acres of land and our goal on the land is to develop a state-of-the-art retreat center that we're able to bring uh, teachers and educators and business people from all across the country and really train them on our model um, we also, um, through our foundation, we started a movement called the Black and Blue Movement, and it's training police officers and um, at academies, and also our goal is to bring them to our retreat center from across the country so that they can have 
um, a better interface with uh, the black community. You know, that's really important. And hopefully, as a result of that, it can kind of um, decrease some of the challenges and and and, and bad things that, that usually happen as a result of that interaction. Sure. In addition to that, we're building an athletic center, an AAU athletic center, that youth from all across the country can come and participate and compete on a national level. And then our goal is to develop a boarding school, an all-male boarding school, starting at ninth grade through 12th grade, and it will be a college preparatory academy as well. So that's our goal. That's what we're working on now, and and hopefully uh, we can bring it to fruition really soon. Certainly. And if someone wanted to get information on that, is that on your website now? Uh, no, that part is not on our website, but our website is very, very, very um, uh, formative, um, I, I, informative, rather. But I would say that um, I have a number that I use just for that purpose, and that number is 817-994-7079, 817-994-7079. That's good. That way, if anyone's interested in participating or helping getting involved with that project, that would be great. I would love that. I would love that. And I do want to say, um, uh, Mr. Walker, that our website is B, as in boy, H, as in Herald, 365.org. That's bh365.org. Okay, good. The other thing you'd, you'd mentioned, I, I remember talking to you, you'd said you'd had a rather extensive board of directors, which was interesting to me. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit, please? Yes, um, we have a really, really um, strong advisory board, uh, if you will. And uh, many people, um, some of you may be familiar with them. We have uh, Kathy Hughes. We have Benjamin Crump. We have um, Lolita, Lolita um, Lewis. Uh, she is the wife of Reginald Lewis, who had the largest merger in the history yes. of Wall Street. Um, we have uh, uh, an ambassador uh, from the Congo. Um, so we just we just have so many people on our advisory board. We have a, a gentleman, Kelvin Mackey. His brother is an actor, Anthony Mackey. He's heralds out of uh, New Orleans, and he's in charge of of the STEM project. It's, it's called STEM NOLA. Okay. And we have so many business people and entrepreneurs. Um, George Frazier, uh, just so many to name. I'm, my mind is racing now, trying to think <laughs> of everyone, and I'm, I'm, I'm probably leaving a number of them out. But, but I think you can you can kind of get the picture. Oh yeah, definitely. And how long have you uh, had this this business, this company? Well, uh, from the heart, um, we've we've had that up and running for about. And I love um, that name, from the heart. Thank you, thank you. We've been operative for about nine, going on nine years now. Um, BH365 is under that leadership, and that we've had that company for three years now. Okay. And we're flourishing. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So there's there's definitely been a lot of uh, growth and turnover, which is excellent. It really has. It really has. It really has. Um, can I go back to, I just want to, my mind is, is coming back now. Yeah. I just want to share some more about our advisory board members. Okay. We have a gentleman by the name of Bill Haley. He's the uh, grandson of Alex Haley, ah. the gentleman who's written Roots. Yes. We have another gentleman by the name of Fatalika Atiba Wiza. He's the executive director of the National Alliance of Black School Educators. We have um, Arkana Chirambori Kwao. She's a medical doctor. He's a former ambassador of the African Union. We have um, Mark Henry. He is known as the world's strongest man. Many of you remember Mark Henry. A gentleman, um, James Page, he's a system analyst for the New York State School Board System. Okay. Uh, we have Benjamin Watson, a former Super Bowl champion, uh, played for the Patriots and also the Saints. 
uh, Kimberly Jones. Uh, she's an attorney out of uh, D.C. Uh, Louis Paul Long. Uh, he owns a, a major art gallery in New York City. Alveda King. She's the uh, niece of um, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. We have Paul Griffin, um, former vice president of Houghton Mifflin, uh, and he's also the past international president of Phi Beta Sigma. We have Robert Jackson, former NFL player and speaker, Patrick Gaston, George Frazier, and, and, and several more. And so I'm really excited to have some, uh, some um, an, an illustrious team uh, like we have to help us with this, with this charge. Right, right. That must have been interesting, getting someone from Houghton Mifflin. Very, very <laughs> much so. And I've known Paul for many years, and I remember when I was a school superintendent, that's when I met him, and we, uh, we stayed in touch. We both are beloved fraternity brothers. And so when he had retired from Houghton Mifflin and I was getting ready to do this, I said, Paul can probably give me a whole lot of advice. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yes. And uh, you mentioned someone else that I don't know if you remember, um, Smokey Robinson, I think you mentioned was involved. Smokey in the Robinson, yes. How can I forget uh, Mr. Robinson? <laughs> incredible, incredible advisory board member. He went on um, The View one day and spoke about our curricula, and we had tons of orders that day. I mean, he has a large following, and I'm, I'm just so impressed. Um, not only with Smokey's music, but the person that he is. Right. I had a chance to spend some time with him in Connecticut, and he spoke um, to about uh, 1,500 students. And he waited until he was able to embrace, rather a handshake or a hug, every child that came his way. He even told his guards, his bodyguards, I'm not rushing, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving until I talk to every student give them a hug, shake their hand, shake their family's hand. And I never seen anything like that. Someone um, as a celebrity status as he is, that would be that patient and that kind and that loving. Right. Um, the, the, the manner in the which, which he was. And that was impressive. That is so good. So good. Yes. So basically, uh, if people wanted to order the book, they would order it from your website. Yes, bh365.org. That's bh365.org. Okay. Yeah, I got mine yesterday, and it is <laughs> very complete. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so very much. Very complete, and uh, lots of information in there. Yes, thank you. I think we have it. Uh, I know we brought it maybe in the car. I wanted to to stand it up so people could see the, the cover and, you know, how nice it is. It's good. Yes. So do you travel and, and do lectures on a regular basis? I do. I do. Um, actually, um, I've traveled a lot. I'm usually on the road at least once a week traveling someplace. Okay. And tomorrow I'm speaking here locally um, at two events. Um, there's a, a black history and culture event in Fort Worth, and then I have another event at a gallery or museum here in downtown Dallas uh, tomorrow evening. So I'm really excited about um, the opportunity to, you know, spread our mission, our charge uh, throughout the country. And, and it's really and exciting. That. I was talking to a friend of mine, close friend of mine I've had since uh, high school, and he absolutely loves your talks. His name is Milton Brown, okay. and he was he texted me. He says, I, I really love what he talks about and the fact that he does not make us victims, which is another exciting thing about what you're doing. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you, you know, I think that what we have to do is eliminate excuses, and I always say that excuses – are the tools of the incompetent used to build great monuments of nothing. Excuses only satisfy those who use them. And excuses will, will primarily keep you stuck. And so we have to make sure that we rid ourselves of the excuses. There are many people 
that have been their back to serve as a bridge for us to walk on. Right. And we have to be honorable in that responsibility to move forward. I think that, that we've learned, um, we've learned and withstood the test of time. And the things that haven't killed us, they, it, it has made us stronger. And so I think that with the level of strength and the understanding of, of moving forward and the ability to persevere, whether the odds are um, insurmountable, perceived, or unperceived, we have to move forward. And I think that we have to allow the greatness that we have from within to move us and to continue to make a, a lasting impact in the lives of so many people across this world. Certainly. Certainly. Definitely agree with that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and uh, I also heard some of your talks at churches as well, and uh, those are very interesting. I really like those. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Awesome. What were some of the things that you implemented with some of the school systems that you can look back and, and say, that's new, that's something I did? Wow. You know... One thing about my board, I had a very I know you've got a long board. resume with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I had a very conservative board uh, in Springfield, um, and I really, I just thank them so much for allowing me to be innovative because one of the things that we wanted to do at that time, we wanted to keep charter schools out. So the board said, hey, you know, we, we always like to maximize efficiencies. However, we want to give you the opportunity to make um, some cutting edge decisions and to help our district to be recognized nationally. And that's what I did. I started a all male academy and all female academy, the young men and uh, young women that came to school every day in, 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 in blue blazers and khaki slacks. And my girls had blazers and, and khaki skirts on. And, and that school, just those kids just did so well academically. And another thing that I did that I was really, really excited about and is still going on today in Springfield, Illinois, and that was the Physicians Preparatory Pipeline Program. The acronym was P3. Mm -hmm. And uh, the goal was to take ninth graders and have them have a problem-based experience after school for four years, and they would work with medical doctors throughout the Capital District of Springfield and in, in their fourth grade, or excuse me, their fourth year, um, they would apply to major in pre-med somewhere in the United States of America. They all would receive a full scholarship to go to school free with the expectation that they would apply to come back to medical school in, in, in Springfield. And if not, um, at least they applied. They could go anywhere in the country um, to, to major in pre-med. And so the goal was to purposely um, introduce students to careers in in the field of medicine. And so we did that. Um, My students were very, very successful. Um, And and it was another way to eliminate those those excuses. Right. Right. That's awesome. Yes. Do you have any other questions, Daryl? Well, it's just he's cover quite a bit here. I mean, you, yes. you don't really know where to begin asking questions, especially <laughs> with all that he has covered here. I mean, it's yes. just welcome to my world a little bit here. <laughs> and, and, and telling him, you know, it's just, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for everything that you've done uh, for our communities. And there are millions of people that would love to know more about how they might be able to move forward, I'm sure. And, you know, through all of that you've done for them. I mean, you know, this is just one of the avenues. This is just one of the smaller things that they might be able to look at making those few steps and taking those few steps to get to where they're going. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, when when we look at, you know, the work that we have to do, you know, our mantra is that Black History 365 is an educational entity um, whose purpose is to create cutting-edge resources that invite students, educators, and other readers to become critical thinkers, compassionate listeners, fact-based, respectful communicators, and action-oriented solutionists. And sometimes um, when we look at the news and we can see that a uh, police officer 
um, has, has had uh, an unfortunate interaction with um, with an individual from various communities, but particularly the black community. And sometimes it, it ends up in a, in, a, in a tragedy or something that's misfortunate. So through our foundation, our goal is to raise $100 million so that we can supply every police officer a copy of the textbook and that we can train at academies across the country as well as precincts across the country so that when a police officer uh, pulls someone over or has to make a house uh, visit or what have you, he or she would wear a blue uh, ribbon that will indicate that they've gone through the training or they have read the textbook or they have the textbook in their, in their possession. And, and hopefully we can educate the community on understanding the importance of interacting with police officers in a caring and meaningful way as well so that um, we can have good solutions um, as a result uh, of, of the outcome that we desire with that interaction. Oh, that's good. So you have a, the, the foundation is separate from the main company, or is it part of it? It's separate. Okay. Um, so our main company is a for-profit company, and our foundation um, is a 501c3. And um, we, we are definitely, um, our goal is to push uh, that relationship with the, um, with the blue community. And that's why the project is called the Black and Blue Project. Okay. Well, I yep. see. So where do you see your company in another five, ten years probably having that facility for, for the youth and for the educators to train? Absolutely. I definitely see that happening um, within the next five years. In addition to that, I see us in even more school systems across the country. You have about 14,000 school districts. And uh, like I said earlier, our goal is to at least be in 5,000, 10,000, and also a number of colleges and universities, um, hospitals. I want our work to be every place so right. that uh, people can read. Um, and, and, and we're constantly pushing out really, really good material. And I think that our material is going to be able to bring the world closer together. You know, like I said, this is our love letter to the world. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully we can impact humanity with, um, with, with us coming together. Absolutely. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so not only is it, it's a social studies project, <clears throat> basically, but there's also benefits for STEM projects from there, too, for people that want to get involved with science and engineering and that type of thing as well. Yes, we have tons of STEM uh, in there um, as well. We have um, technology because if you think in terms of a lot of the invention that we really benefit from today, uh, many people of African descent are responsible for some of those inventions. I mean, if we look at um, Zoom um, and Teams, um, a, a black woman uh, by the name of Ms. Cloak, she's responsible for developing um, Teams and, and Zoom. I know that when we were dealing with the pandemic, the fear was, how are we going to be able to communicate, you know, with our loved ones? How are we going to be able to continue to do commerce and business and those things? So we made sure that we had a strong integration of technology throughout the textbook. Right. I can see that. That's, that's wonderful. And we use that every day now. Absolutely. And the QR code was a very... Um, important tool that we wanted to use because people can you know bring videos you know up on their phones and and watch an extension of things that they read about um, in our work right so yeah so that was really important to us what's wonderful that i like about this what you're doing is it gives uh, young people a chance to look at different areas as opposed to not not there's anything wrong with it but as opposed to entertaining and sports. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And we took um, sports, um, you know, from a different angle. Yes. Um, we wanted to really 
focus on students becoming more intellectually astute, um, being able to use their minds opposed to physicality, and understanding that they stand on the shoulders of giants. And they have to really think uh, of, of, of themselves as an intellectual giant. Right. Because it's so many times that when you go across the country, especially in inner city, and you ask young people what are their desired aspirations, what do they want to become, and the first thing they say is a football player or a basketball player. And I know many athletes and many former professional and current professional football players that not only are good on the football field, the basketball court, the baseball field, but they are also good in the boardroom. They are also good in the classroom. Yes. And so we have to help students understand that they have to marry the cognitive with the physical. They have to marry the linguistic with the cognitive and the physical as well. That is so good. Yes. Well, how can we better help you spread the word? I know we definitely want to have you back on, maybe even do a regular segment with you. I would love that. <laughs> Yeah. I would love that. And not only me, maybe other people within our company could come on and really just talk about this work. Because I think communication is going to be the linchpin for us to really get the word out. Right. And I think that when people, are, uh, they can see the material uh, that we have, they can see that it hopefully it's well put together and it's making uh, a difference in their lives. And one of the things that I'm really excited about, because... Armstrong Williams, uh, he was able to read our work, and he says, hey, I want to be in that book. And so we were able to um, infuse him into the e-book, our electronic book. And when we do our next, next update for the hard copy, he's going to be in the hard copy as well. So we're constantly updating things, keeping things current and relevant, and making sure that um, we're capturing history even as we go and as we move forward. Right. That's important. Well, let's see. I wanted to bring out the book uh, because if people are online, they can see how how large that book is and how <laughs> how great it looks. Well, yeah, it definitely is a heavy book, and our um, Latino Caribbean book is probably going to be a little bigger. Okay. <laughs> and and when is that one set to come out? Yeah, we're probably going to unveil that uh, in June. Okay. And it's going to first be oh, unveiled in soon. New York City public schools. Yep, um, our people are working on it uh, night and day because we're capturing every aspect of, of, of Latin history. We're, okay. we're hitting all countries um, in Latin America, and also we're hitting every country in the Caribbean islands as well. Oh, that's amazing. You know, yeah, that's being able good. to tell their story a little bit too, you know, and being in that book is really good. You know, so it gives them a chance to relay how they actually are taking those steps, as I said earlier, and you know, walking, you know, in the steps that people have in the past. Absolutely, and one of the most incredible things that we're finding out, you know, and people have to understand that the slave trade did not only hit. America, it was it was all over the world. It was a smattering of places throughout um, the world that the slave trade um, touched, and so we definitely want to tell that story. And when we finish this this work, um, the Latin Caribbean uh, textbook, we're going to do one to talk about blacks and people of color in Europe um, since the Middle Ages. Oh, good. So that would cover uh, the Moors and that type of history, also. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll go. We'll go even even more in depth by looking at some of the kings and and the queens uh, who were people of color uh, in Europe, and some of the explorers and people that made a deep and lasting impact to this day. But it's it's information that was never told to the world. Right now, now I've got another question. So your book on black history, does that cover uh, African history or is it limited to American history? 
I that is a, a fan. That. that is a fantastic question. Um, that that is a great great question. We cover ancient Africa. We cover Africa before uh, the the contemporary geopolitical turn, like Nigeria and Ghana. Okay. We go all the way back to the ancient kingdoms, ah. and we talk about the ancient kingdoms. Okay. And then we come all the way. Um, past, um, you know, the deal uh, political terminology, and then we go all the way through um, American history, all the way past George Floyd. Okay. And so, yeah, so the main thing that's really interesting is that um, what I found out is that many people are not aware of, of, of ancient African history. And so we definitely wanted to tell that story as well. Okay. Now it covers people like uh, Bonsa Musa also in that range? Yes, it does. Okay. I, I was going to bring that up. You know, just yep. it's one of the questions that I was debating whether or not I should even ask. It's just that was kind of important for me, but I didn't know if that was something that was appropriate for this conversation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it really is, and we, we, we have a lot of we have a, a large spread on Mansa Musa wow. and and the impact that he he made. You know, people yeah. probably today even think they are you know a Mansa Musa, but it's quite amazing. You know, that is quite an amazing story in itself. You oh know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It it really is, and, and just um, people are not aware that he also was a philanthropist. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, of course he had to be. <laughs> yeah, the richest man that ever lived. Right. I mean, he he could have fund the entire world almost. You know, just about. Well, of course. Um, just an incredible story, um, and a story of of love. And we talk about the various sides of Mansa Musa. We go really, really deep into his life, into his family, into his upbringing, and all. Oh, those I've things. got to open that book up and start reading it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So we don't. We don't get out of uh, ancient Africa until I mean, we don't leave Africa. We're, we're, we're well, well into 200 plus pages before we even leave Africa. Wow. Yeah. And most, um, you know, traditional textbooks, you don't even, they don't even get to slavery. <laughs> um, I'm talking about to introduce us as, as black. Well, it's just a, a, a limited understanding of what it is. You know, Absolutely. we're trying to say, and when we have the chance to do that ourselves, or in your case, with people that you have that are helping you make this thing a, a, a real thing, Absolutely. then it, it just turns into something that we're able to understand what we're trying to say ourselves. And 100%. You know, it's just, it doesn't really resonate with somebody that's trying to say it a different way. Exactly. But, you know, exactly. it's just, and, you know, and, and, and explaining it a way that they could understand it as opposed to a way that people really understand it. You know, that's right. From from that's right. from a different point of view. Exactly, and and one of the things that we wanted to really be conscious of is to make sure that we didn't denounce any group of people or anyone to elevate another group. Right. We wanted to. We looked at Eurocentric history. Look at. Going to err on the side of true centrism. You know, we we tell the truth. Yeah, and sure. and we have all the the research, the the data, everything to support that. You know, this work went through a strict form of scrutiny by a lot of historical societies, especially Asala, where they challenged our research, um, sent the things back in red that we had to go, you know, go back and make changes. And so, but we wanted everything to be taken through the ringer like that yeah, for so sure. that we can right. give a product that no one could argue about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're looking at it from your point of view, and, and I don't think anybody can question that. It's just, you know, is it your point of view? That's probably the only question you get to ask. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you mentioned it took about three years to write it, correct? Yes, it Together did. Gather everything mm -hmm. and to write it. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, but we're, in, you know, we're, we're constantly putting out new material. We have 
tons of uh, supports. Like we have um, uh, university professor and, and, and teacher resource guides that go with it. Um, we have home guides so that people want to, you know, teach it at home. Uh, they can teach it at home in their community, their churches, wherever. We have supports in place so that you can um, distribute the information. Um, we have curricula items built into the book. We have critical thinking uh, components. We have, you know, familial uh, information. So we just have tons of work. Our design team, our curricula team, uh, they're just amazing. And so we say that this work is from K to great. Great. So it, it, it touches all ages, and it's for all ages and all stages of people. So there's study guides that go along with the book also then? Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we have resource guides, study guides, um, activity guides, all of those things. Great. And, so, and how are the updates done? Are they uh, sent out periodically, or how does that work? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, we... We do our updates, like when we come across information, we update quickly into our ebook. Okay. And then when we're, when we're doing a new edition or new print, we add those additions into the hard copy so that we can make sure that we're staying current and also relevant. So we're constantly researching things. Like um, I have a team now that's looking at um, the young lady that, um, that invented Zoom and Teams, you know, through Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the, the unfortunate situation that happened in Memphis. So we're, we're capturing all of those things so that when we do our updates, we can make sure that we infuse those items. Very good. What is your website again, please? <laughs> yes, it's a B as in black, H as in history, 365.org. Okay. CH365.org. Okay, great. And this is KCAA Radio. You're listening to the Business and Sustainability Hour on AM 105. AM 1050, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we were we going to take a break for a talk about one of our sponsors I think this would be a good time to do that uh, one of our sponsors that we're very proud of is Dr. Steen Block's Regenerative Medicine Center located here in Southern California in San Clemente if you have a difficult issue that you need to have addressed or looked at that other doctors are Let's say having a problem giving you a straight answer, contact Dr. Steenblock. Their phone number is area code 949-367-8870. Ask for Naomi, and she'll set up a consultation for you. Okay, we can get back to our questions. So from, from here, basically, you want to get more books out to more schools, to more individuals, to more colleges, and to start your project, your project for the students and for the educators. Absolutely, absolutely. I definitely want to do that and get books into many homes across this country. And um, we have to move forward with the project because... As we uh, embark upon building uh, the first school, we want to replicate this model all over the nation. Okay. And so, you know, we have to start someplace. And so we're looking for partners, um, people that are interested in uh, investing and being part of a, a very wor worthy cause. And we're excited about the momentum uh, that we currently have now. Um, and, and our goal is to continue to move forward. Okay. And if people want to get involved, could you please give that number out again? Absolutely. I'll be more than happy to. It's 
8179. That's 817-994-7079. Great. Okay. Okay, looks like we're starting to wind down. It was such a pleasure having you on. <clears throat> really on it. <clears throat> Definitely. And if people want to uh, book you for a speaking session, they call that number also. Is that correct? Yes. If people wanted to book me for a speaking session, um, the person that keeps my calendar is Lisa Petros. Okay. And her phone number is 217-220-2716. That's 217-220-2716. Okay. Sorry. Wow, well, it's certainly been a pleasure, pleasure having you here, and it's uh, unbelievable. The KCAA Loma Linda at 106.5 FM, K298.